today we revisit chapter 4 where Amos had begun to insult and even sarcastically invite Israel to worship. And here he begins to turn his attention towards some events that they've lived through, some really hard times. And he wants them to interpret these hard times theologically. And in those crises, attempt to see them as an opportunity to return to God. Amos chapter 4, starting in verse 6. I gave you empty stomachs in every city and lack of bread in every town, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when the harvest was still three months away. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. One field had rain, another had none, and dried up. People staggered from town to town for water, but I did not give enough to drink. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Locusts devoured your fig and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as I overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You are like a burning stick snatched from the fire, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. This is what I will do to you, Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. He who forms the mountains, creates the wind, and reveals his thoughts to man. He who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of earth, the Lord Almighty is his name. So after calling the wealthy women in Samaria cows, <coughs> right, getting their attention, drawing them awake, he invites them to worship. Go to your places of worship sarcastically. And here at the end of this passage, Amos quotes what appears to be an ancient hymn. He is, in fact, inviting them to song. He's also inviting them to reflect on the current events of their lives. As you see, this is not future prediction. These are struggles that Israel has had in the recent past. One of the things that's helpful about interpreting the Bible is noticing repetitions, and you'll notice a few here, of reported hardship and Israel's response. Reported hardship and Israel's response. Reported hardship number one, famine. What did Israel do in the midst of famine? Well, it's apparent, according to God, that they didn't seek Him. Do you see how they tried to solve the problem on their own? Does it occur to you when you experience hardship that part of the hardship may be because you are out of line with God? There are other books of the Bible that help complete our perspective on this, say the book of Job or the book of Ecclesiastes these wisdom literature books that wrestle with the fact that what if even we seem to be in right relationship with God and hardship still comes? There is such a thing as righteous suffering. I don't want to dismiss that notion. But here, what God is inviting them to do is reflect on their relationship with Him during hardship. I think this is the appropriate question to ask when hardship surfaces in our lives. Where is God in this? If you can imagine this crisis and, and kind of picture in your head what is happening, you have a, a drought or a famine and people are going back and forth, frantically searching for what they're looking for. Meanwhile, God waits to be approached. It's not just water. It's not just food. It's not just provision. It's not just security. I'm what you're looking for, and you haven't sought me. Many times I struck your gardens and vineyards. I struck them with blight and mildew. Blight and mildew. What's that all about? Our orchardist prophet is browsing the orchards, finding evidence of covenant judgment. 
Blight and mildew, this word pair, appears in a key passage within Scripture. And guys, this gives us a clue as to the covenant framework we are to interpret these disasters under. We've mentioned before that Israel has this special relationship with God, this covenant relationship that began really all the way back at Abraham, and really if you think about it, all the way back at Adam. But it clarified, it took on a specific aspect under the Sinaitic Covenant during the days of Moses. This covenant contract between God and his people involved blessings and curses. If they broke covenant, if they left the special relationship they had with God, there would be curses. In order to get a clear picture of a covenant curse, you will need to pause the video and read Deuteronomy 28. Let me read from Douglas Stewart's commentary in the Word Biblical Commentary series on the book of Amos. He says about verse 6, Since the days of Moses, the Israelites had been told that covenantal punishments were intended not only to be retributive, in other words, getting back at Israel for what they had done wrong, but also to force the nation to return to Yahweh. These covenant curses weren't designed to make life hard on Israel for the sake of making life hard on Israel. These covenant curses were designed to provoke repentance, return to their God. If, if we want to make this a little bit more personal, perhaps we could reach out to the story of the prodigal son. Jesus talks about this guy who wanted to leave the covenant relationship he had with his father and to end that relationship. And life without the providing, protecting father got harder and harder and emptier and emptier. The natural consequence of leaving the living God and covenant relationship with him. Eventually you become less and less human. What is happening in the chaos around us, Israel asks. And for some reason, it fails to identify that what is happening is symptomatic of covenant curse. In other words, God is showing them through every way he knows how that they have broken covenant with God. So the devoured fig tree, right? Amos is this sycamore fig caretaker, and he notices that blight and mildew has struck the vineyards. It has struck the orchards. And here he notices, here is the fruit of disobedience. And then guys, did you catch this plague? Plague like Egypt? So, so even illness is now interpreted as a disaster that God is causing into the framework of covenant curse. And even military defeat. So, Guys, let's take a step back from this text and look at the broader framework involved here. And then we'll talk about the spiritual diagnosis that Amos gives. In the broader ancient Near Eastern world, everything was theological. All of life's problems had an origin point in a relationship with one's deity. Daniel Block writes, in the ancient Near East, all of life, be it individual or corporate, was viewed from a theological perspective. There was a deity nation land association, a tripartite relationship. I might ask the question to we of secularized Western culture. When hardship happens in our life, do we ask ourselves, God, where are we with you? Do we identify the hardship in our life as a theological issue? What I want to say here is that the land is telling them something. The creation is accusing them as well. Daniel Migliori writes, The Bible not only presents the non-human world as part of God's good creation, it also views the whole creation as mysteriously entangled in the drama of sin and redemption and included in the hope of God's coming kingdom. Creation is indicting them of covenant infraction also. It sounds weird for us in the Western secularized culture that we are in, right? That the ancient world viewed uh, 
problems with uh, agriculture or ecology or disease. They all interpreted this biological aspect of life as theological. Okay, so we, we see that for Israel, but, but does that remain true for us? Well, let me just suggest this. It's a biblical notion when hardship happens, be it ecological, economical, medical, that within the context of Scripture, one could say that it is a biblical notion that a proper response is to at least ask the question, where do I stand with God right now? That's exactly what Israel hasn't done. It's repeated four times. Verse 6, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 8, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 9, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Verse 10, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What is God wanting from his people in times of hardship? He's wanting them to return to him. Let's take a look at this word here for return. It's a, it's a wonderful and rich word in Hebrew. This word in Hebrew, shuv, is repent, turn, return, or even restore. In this context, repentance is the intended meaning. So this turning, this repentance, this renewal of relationship, that's what God wants them to do. They're going around city to city looking for water, looking for food, looking for fruit, looking for victory. What do they really need? They need to return to Yahweh, their relationship with Yahweh, God of the cosmos. So maybe this sounds a little bit too Old Testament for us to apply to our own scenario, right? I think it's worth asking the question. Think about the things that we're experiencing right now. Think about the things that the globe is experiencing right now. One might suggest that it is the more biblical notion to assume that the problem with the world environmentally, ecologically, medically is related to our relationship with God. When we zoom down to the individual, say, like in the case of Job, this idea of righteous suffering and, and not getting a full understanding of why God would let the righteous suffer, that also is a biblical notion. But I think either way we interpret the disaster in our lives, I think God wants us to seek Him. So if for Israel, the covenant disobedience was expressing itself in the environment, in the health, in the resources, do you think it would be worth asking the question if some of the things that are happening in our own country are a result of an infraction against humanity's relationship with God? There were things that Israel did to defile the land. There were things that would not only break the relationship between God and his people, and the people between one another, but also the people's relationship to their place. Spiritual pollution happened on a number of levels. Some of the things mentioned in the Bible include idolatry, immorality, bloodshed, and broken trees. When these things happened in the land, there could be dire consequences, including famine, ecological disaster, war, and plague. So this biblical construct that Daniel Block talks about, this idea of a relationship between God, a people, and a place, that when we violate things against God, that it expresses itself in the place. So think about some things that have happened on American soil. Think of the injustices that have happened on American soil. To name a few, think of the Trail of Tears and the genocide of the native people. Think of the slavery and perpetuation of mistreatment of African Americans. Think of the police brutality in recent days. From a biblical perspective, this land has been defiled, a crime against God. 
all of the things that God talks about that defiles the land has happened on our place. And oftentimes, the things that have happened on American soil have been done in the name of God. So as we look and we survey the crises that Israel was in at this time, and the fact that four times God mentions they haven't returned to him, 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 we get a sense of the trap we ourselves can fall into. When hardship of any kind strikes our place, are we asking ourselves the question, do we need to repent of anything? And I'm not talking about just individually, but corporately, church. Do we need to repent of anything? I don't know that I want to answer that question directly, because I think the point of this passage in particular is to remind Israel, and vicariously us, that at the heart of the crisis is an opportunity to repent and to return to God. Anything, any hardship, can propel us towards a relationship with God. This closing fragment of a hymn, He who forms the mountains creates the winds and reveals his thoughts to man. Who, he who turns dawn to darkness and treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Guys, I believe God is in control. I believe God is sovereign. I believe that the issues that Israel faced were issues that God allowed to happen as a way to convey their need for a renewal in the relationship between him and his people. If that was true of Israel and the nature of God is consistent, why would I not assume that God as sovereign is Lord over the earth today? The climate change, the pandemic, the food insecurities. Perhaps these frustrations of the world are God's way of reminding us of our great need to return to Him. Let us not be unwilling to turn, to return, shuv, to God. Let us be willing and eager, no matter what's going on, to repent. So I know these are kind of tough and strange concepts for many of us, but I think the occasion remains. In the hardship we face today, will we seek God? Amos is about to provide us with a tool for seeking God, and we're going to spend some time chewing on it. It's called lament. So just remember that God is sovereign over the cosmos and what he wants through all of his motions, his frameworks, his intentions, his designs. What he wants most is for you to seek him. Turn your face towards him. And when we do, we may experience the blessing. Remember the ironic blessing? I'll say it in Hebrew. When we do turn to God, He has an abundant and amazing blessing to give us. You see, that was prefigured all the way back, just after the curse section that we so painfully tread through. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We need to read it too. Lift your spirits and read Deuteronomy 30. Really, like go, pause it right now, go. So when we have the crises in our lives and we seek God, this is what is waiting for us. A new heart, a new covenant, and a new hope. And we Christians know how that takes shape. It takes shape in the wonderful and amazing relationship we have with God through Jesus Christ. So may we be people who turn towards God when things are tough. All right, Godspeed. We'll see you next time.